And so if you would please just keep your mics muted and the, uh, you're welcome to have your cameras on, but just keep in mind it's going to be part of the recording potentially. So if, if you'd like to turn, turn them off, that's, that may be a good idea too. So we will be uh, addressing questions at the end. Megan will be addressing questions at the end. So you're welcome to go ahead and post them in the chat as you think of them. And then we will get to them at the end of the presentation. So with that, I am going to go ahead and introduce our presenter from today. Our presenter is Megan Cassidy. Megan is a naturalist, photographer, and a strong advocate of everything in class arachnida. She can also be found in Texas parks, taking micro photography of small critters such as spiders and insects or hosting nighttime spider walks. Some of her photos have been published in journals and books, such as an upcoming publication from Texas A&M Press titled Mindful of Texas Nature, a project with author and herpetologist Michael Smith. Some of you may also know her as Wild Carrot on iNaturalist, and chances are she's identified your spiders. Welcome, Megan. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Okay, let me get my screen shared for you guys. So yeah, my name is Megan Cassidy. I live in Texas for close to 11 years now. I'm originally from Delaware. Um, I've been a spider enthusiast for close to five years now. Um, it's kind of what I do in my spare time. Um, I'm actually an analyst, data analyst by day, and I look for spiders and stuff by night pretty much. And occasionally I'll actually do outreach and education. I'll do walks and talks. I've done some for Southwest Nature Preserve, Fort Worth Nature Center, and even at Leela. So hopefully I'll get to see you guys at some point out in actual nature to look at some spiders up close and personally. So I've always been kind of drawn to spiders ever since I was a child. We would actually go out on the porch and watch the orb weavers make their webs next to the lights and watch them eat stuff. So I'm going to talk today about spiders in the prairie, but really you're going to get kind of a big, a bunch of spiders that you can find in Texas in general, because I'm going to actually talk a little bit about arachnids in general and then dive into spiders specifically. Okay. So my goals for this talk for you guys is basically to bring some appreciation to often misunderstood animals. I want to really show off how diverse and awesome these animals are because they are really cool. I would like to convert some folks from maybe spider killers to spider lovers. And if maybe not lovers, maybe you'll be more indifferent or less inclined to kill them. Um, I would also like just to give an idea of spiders that you may come across as you're exploring different areas and different prairies in Texas. So this little saying right here um, really sums up why I love spiders and just how I feel about them and just little insects in general. But she asked me to kill the spider. Instead, I get the most peaceful weapons I can find. I take a cup and a napkin. I catch the spider, I put it outside, and I allow it to walk away. If I am ever caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, just being alive and not bothering anyone, I hope I am greeted with the same kind of mercy. And that's by Rudy Francisco. And then this one is just kind of for fun. I found it online, actually. Um, if you choose not to find joy in the spiders, you will have less joy in your life, but still the same amount of spiders. They are literally all around us all the time. <laughs> and I'll kind of go through that a little bit. So to get started, I'm going to give you guys a quick intro to class arachnida. So all spiders are arachnids, but not all arachnids are spiders. Um, this right here is a little crab spider that's hiding on some liatris at Mary Talbot Prairie. And there are about 12 orders in class arachnida. Some of those are going to be harvestmen, scorpions, spiders, pseudoscorpions, and we'll kind of go through some of those quickly. But to start with, I want to do some really super basic spider anatomy for you guys. Um, and that's because there's a, like really a pattern with the arachnids. So we're going to start with this spider. This is actually a pretty wool spider I found out in Brownsville. Uh, now, as you may know, spiders typically will have eight legs. Even if a spider misses a leg or two because it gets ripped off for whatever reason, they are still spiders, they're not insects. Um, so they have eight legs, that's two, four, six, eight on each side. And then what you'll also notice is number one here is pointing to another pair of appendages called pedipalps. 
And these are typically used for sensory reasons or also for reproduction for males. So the males will typically have these kind of bulbous things on the end and that's actually for reproduction. Two is pointing to the cephalothorax. This is kind of the head of a spider. This is where, you know, all the good brain parts and neurological system is there. They have their eyes up there. And then three is the abdomen. Um, that's more of their digestive system and stuff like that. And at the very end, you'll actually have the spinnerets and that's where that silk comes from. So another view of another spider, this is a jumping spider and one that you guys might see a lot, the bold jumping spider. And just to give you guys another look here, we have the chelicerae. Um, and this is the thing where the actual fangs stick out of. They're like little tiny hypodermic needles with a little hole in the end where venom comes out. And then here again, there's just another look at the pedipalps that stick out in the front. So they're, they're pretty cute spiders in my opinion. So just really briefly, this is kind of the view of the uh, arachnid taxonomy. So you have mites and ticks and tailless whip scorpions and all kinds of stuff. I'm gonna focus on the ones that are highlighted in blue and just kind of give you guys a quick overview of those. And we are gonna start with uh, apillions or harvestmen. So you guys might have seen these before. These are those little things that bounce on those really long legs. And I think they're often called daddy long legs. Um, now I have a problem with common names because they're often associated with more than one organism. So these guys are called daddy long legs by some people, but also cellar spiders that are true spiders are often called daddy long legs. And I've even seen people call crane flies, a type of fly, uh, a daddy long leg. So they can get kind of confusing, but essentially these are harvestmen. Um, now compared to spiders, they have one body segment, not two. So it's a fused single body segment. Um, and they're actually um, scavengers. They'll eat eggs and, you know, small insects and dead material. One of the common myths you might have heard about these, and I know I have, is that they are actually the most venomous spider in the world, but their fangs are too small to penetrate human skin. Well, there's a lot wrong with that statement. The first thing, they're not spiders. They're harvestmen. They're in their own little, you know, section of arachnids. Um, number two, they don't produce any venom at all. They're not venomous. They're, they're completely harmless to humans. So there's a couple things wrong with that. And then here's kind of an up close picture of another one. And so you can see it has that fused body segment. It has two little eyes on the top of their heads and it's actually eating a dead moth. I think we were out mothing when we saw this happen, but they're scavengers and they're completely harmless. Now this next one, these are super cool. These are Thelophanita or vinegaroons. Um, they're actually named due to the smell of the concentrated acetic acid liquid that they shoot from their rear end over here when they're threatened. Now, to give you an example of how strong this acetic acid is, um, our white vinegar on the table that we use is about 5% acetic acid. These guys shoot out 85% acetic acid. So super strong. They look really cool and prehistoric. They are arachnids. They have one, two, three, four pairs of legs right there. And these things that look like claws or grabbers are actually modified pedipalps. So pretty cool. Um, this guy was almost four inches long, found out at Madden Prairie in August. And I do have a quick video I'm gonna show you guys of how cool these things are. Give me one sec to pull that up. Okay. Here you go. So that first pair of really long legs that you see move and they're actually gonna use that for sensory and she's kind of feeling around with those. But again, they're, they're pretty harmless unless you get that acetic acid in your eye if you're bothering them. Um, I was lucky enough to not get squirted in the eye. This is her actually lifting her booty up to try to shoot me with it because she was irritated that I was bothering her. But we let her go on her way. We just took some pictures and that was it. So let's get back over. Okay, and here we go. So the next type of arachnid we're gonna talk about quickly are ticks and mites, and they are not just a bother to humans. Um, they'll often catch ride on beetles. So I found this really cute beetle that I was taking a picture of. Um, it was probably like this big. Um, it actually flipped over to play dead. It's not dead, it's just kind of, they play dead sometimes when you go to look at them. And on the other side, I got really close and I could actually see all these little mites that are hanging on this, this beetle, which was pretty cool. There's even some up here. So that's called forestry. Um, so 
what they'll do is they'll basically attach themselves to something that flies or moves around and that's how they'll get to a new location. So some ticks and mites are parasitic and some are phoretic. So pretty cool. Um, it kind of actually makes my skin crawl, to be honest, looking at that, even though I do love arachnids. Um, the next one we have up that you guys might have seen are the striped bark scorpions. So scorpions are another arachnid. Again, you have one, two, three, four pairs of legs, and these are kind of like their modified pedipalps there. Um, they're really common across Texas. Uh, the sting does hurt from what I'm told, though I have not yet been stung by one, crossing my fingers there. Um, the other cool thing about scorpions is that they'll often glow under UV light. And I'll show you guys an example of that soon. But here's kind of a close-up detail because they do have that stinger in the back where they inject venom into their prey. They're super cool. You can actually see a little drop of venom down there. And then what I love to do is I will, during my spider walks at night, I'll actually carry around a blacklight flashlight so we can look for some of these guys because they do glow and it looks really neat under the UV lights. So speaking of scorpions, there's another one called the pseudoscorpion. And now to give you kind of a scale for this, this was on a concrete picnic bench. And these are the little tiny itty bitty flecks of rock in that concrete. So this guy was actually about two millimeters in length. So this is a super skeleton picture. This is a pseudoscorpion, they have no venom. They do have these little pinchers up here, but they will actually play, prey on larvae, book lice, ants, mites, and other small little critters. Um, they're, other, they're also another good example of pheresis. So the first one that I've ever found in Texas, actually, I was doing what I normally do. And I was at Leela and I was looking at a spider web that I found and I was trying to find the spider, but I did find this, you know, fly in the web. And I was like, oh, you know what? That's an observation for an actual, let me take a picture of it. I get home to process this photo. And then right up here, you can actually see a little pseudoscorpion that was attached to that fly. So he definitely hitched the wrong ride um, and they both got caught in that web. So the next arachnid, and these are actually some of my favorites, and I think they're kind of goofy looking up close, uh, but these are solifuges or solifigi. So they're also called camel spiders, and they're also called wind scorpions, though they're not spiders and they're not scorpions. They're their own class, they're their own order of arachnids. Um, they're kind of cute in my opinion, but they also have those four pairs of legs. And these long legs here in the front are actually modified pedipalps have a better image of one right here. And we found these out at Madden Prairie, so out west, kind of near Colorado City. It's a really sandy and kind of dry out there. Um, and let me show you a video because these are also very cool. Give me one sec to pull that up. They will actually dig burrows in the sand and the dirt, which is really cool to watch. We actually watched one do this along the, the two track road where we were driving. So this is her, she's burrowing in there and pushing that dirt out because she wants to create a cute little burrow. So now here in Texas, they can get pretty big a few inches probably, but there are some in other countries that get way bigger. Um, again, these guys actually don't have any venom, but I will kind of point out what they do have and what they do. Give me one sec to get back to our slideshow. Okay. So they again have those four pairs of legs. They have actually four jaws that work independently. And they actually have some stuff on the ends of their pedipal modified pedipalps here that are kind of almost sticky. So they'll actually grab stuff, bring it to their jaws and kind of just shred it apart. And I will not show you guys a video of that this time, but I do have videos of that because I actually kept one of these for a little while. It was kind of fun for me at least to watch. Okay. And then of course, arachnids, we have um, spiders, the typical spiders that we'll see are rainy. Those are your, you know, orb weavers, your crab spiders, your jumping spiders, stuff like that. So that's all, you know, they're all also part of arachnids. And then you have your mygalomorph spiders. So those are your tarantulas and your trapdoor spiders, bigger ones. So here's a nice big brown tarantula we saw out at Colorado City at the state park. Um, this was me taking pictures of her. She was not happy. She actually reared her legs up. Um, and this is kind of what I saw. So this is her. 
she's kind of showing me her fangs and that's kind of a signal, leave me alone or I will bite you. Um, you can see the bright red under there too. But again, I just took some pictures and let her go. Didn't want to bother her or irritate her too much. So now let's go through a little bit of ecology and natural history of spiders. There are over a thousand species of spiders in Texas. Um, I think iNaturalist so far shows around 460 species, which is really cool. Um, I'm basically just going to show a lot of pictures because that's the way I like to show off these animals and we'll just kind of go from there. So when I started learning spiders, I started with understanding the families of spiders and the types of spiders. And again, I'm going to be talking about specifically the Araneomorphy spiders, the little ones like the orb weavers and stuff like that. So they have different eye arrangements for different families typically, which is pretty cool and it's really helpful to understand what kind of spider you're looking at. For example, number one here, this guy, that's actually a wolf spider. So he's got those two big eyes, four little ones in a row underneath and two on the top, almost to the side. Um, jumping spiders, that's these two right here. They got those really big eyes and they actually have really good vision for spiders. And they do have essentially eyes on the back of their heads, which are kind of cool. And then you have this one, which is really cool, the long jawed orb weavers that will actually go through some pictures of those. So they're very diverse. There's lots of different types. Um, it's really cool. Now, some spiders will have eight eyes, six eyes, and some even don't have any eyes. So there are spiders that actually evolve to live in caves and they don't have any eyes because why do they need them? It's completely dark all the time. So it is not always possible to ID spiders to species. Um, some families like the lycosids or the wolf spiders, they're hyper diverse. They're maybe not well documented or studied sometimes. And a lot of them look the same, just, as, just from a picture. So arachnologists will actually dissect spiders and use the epigymenum in the females, that's their reprodu reproductive structure, or the pedipalps in the males to determine species. So again, eye arrangement is super helpful to understand the families of the spiders, but you can't always get down to a, you know, a species level, unfortunately, with just a picture. So let's talk about sexing spiders. So on the left, you have a female Argiopurantia or the yellow garden spider. These are super common across Texas. You've probably seen them. And on the left is a male, or sorry, on the right is a male. So the scale here is actually important. So this is a really kind of zoomed in image of the male. If you were to put him next to her, he would be maybe just as long as her cephalothorax, her head right there. So the males are usually typically smaller than the females. Um, in some species and some families like jumping spiders, there's not as much dimorphism in the sizes, but typically the females will have larger abdomens Males will have smaller abdomens, um, and the males have those big box and glove looking structures on their pedipalps. Um, there's also coloration differences in spiders in the males and females. Some really cool ones are actually in the jumping spiders. They're almost like birds. So the males will have these bright colors and extra like um, hair sticking out in different angles and stuff, and they'll actually dance and do displays for the females. And the females of those species will kind of be very neutral and tan and just kind of blend in with the undergrowth and the substrate. So that's pretty cool. Here's a close up of a male Argiopurantia or the, you know, the garden spider. And I'm going to zoom in here because these are those reproductive structures that I was talking about, those pedipalps in the front. So this is just kind of the detail. And again, these are used for sperm depositing in the females. And then here's the female, Argioparantia, and I got lucky because she was actually so big that I didn't even need to use a macro lens for this one. She was huge. Um, but given here, you can see this is the epigynum, that's her reproductive structure there, but there's actually a couple other really cool structures you can see under here, especially with these really big spiders like the yellow garden spiders. So over here you have the book lungs. And those are actually the organs that spiders use for oxygen exchange. So they're called book lungs because they have many slats or pages for surface area. And then at the bottom here, these are her um, spinnerets. So they're kind of like the spigots that the silk comes out of. And speaking of silk, um, spiders have many different types of silk. I think there's like eight or nine different types and they will use it for different things. They'll do web spinning, they'll create sleeping sacks, they'll create egg sacs like we see here. So there's a variety of silks for a variety of different reasons. 
Um, now, the egg stacks can sometimes be very distinct by species. So the Argiobarantia, this is kind of what they look like. These were huge because they were also big spiders, but they're kind of like big balls with this black stuff kind of stretched around it. So they're pretty distinct looking. So this is a basilical orb weaver. And for some reason, I don't often see the adults very much, but what you might see if you're walking through like a forested area is you might see these little tiny balls dangling down from a single thread. So these are basilica or beaver egg sacs. So sometimes you'll just see like a single ball or maybe two or three. I've seen up to I think seven of them maybe at once, but these are their egg sacs. And the other cool part about spiders is people often think they're just, you know, these vicious creatures that just want to kill and eat everything. But a lot of spiders actually care for their young for brief periods of time. So lycosids or wolf spiders will actually carry around their egg sac by their abdomen until they're ready to hatch. You can actually see a little baby spider right here. So they're actually starting to already hatch. For the wolf spiders, what happens next is the babies will actually sit on a mom's abdomen until they're ready to hunt on their own. So here's a picture of them close up all over their abdomen. So you may have seen those, they're, they're running around and they just have all these little things moving on their backs. It's pretty cool. These are the babies. Um, this one, the babies were probably getting close to being ready to go off on their own and they're just kind of crawling all over mom's face being annoying as, you know, sometimes they are, but they're really cute. And then Another thing, again, males and females, they can often live together. So the females don't always kill the male spiders. That's another misconception. They definitely will sometimes, especially if they're hungry or if the mating display is not good enough, they will totally eat the male occasionally. But then you have things like mesh weavers or dictinids. And this is the female and this is the male. And these are actually really super tiny um, spiders. They're like, I think around a centimeter maybe. They live on the tips of grasses. Um, if you look at grasses and on some leaves, you'll often see them. Um, so this is a male and female, they're sharing a web. And here's kind of a close up. And this also shows you that dimorphism. So the female has that big abdomen, the male's abdomen's a little bit smaller. The male has those big, you know, pedipalp boxing glove looking things. The females are just kind of basic. So they do sometimes live together. And the cool part about spiders also is how they, they grow. So in order to grow, they will molt. So they'll shed their exoskeleton. And you can't always tell the exact species from a shed skin. Um, usually you can't tell much because they're kind of shredded apart, but sometimes you get kind of lucky. Now this one, it still had the details of the spider on the top of the cephalothorax area and the eye arrangement. And with this striping, it told me that this is a Rabidosa species. Or, so it's one of the wolf spiders and it's a Rabidosa wolf spider, which I'll show you guys in a little bit. And here's another uh, molt there. This one, I can tell because of the eye arrangement and just the overall shape of this, that this is a jumping spider molt. Um, and the cool part is you can even see the iridescence on the chelicery still here. This is also the spider sleeping sack right behind it. So it literally just molted and probably went right back into its sleeping sack uh, for protection. Now, next, let's talk about how spiders hunt. So, like I said, there's probably like seven or eight different species, different types of spider silk, and the silk is actually made out of really strong proteins. Um, now, different types have different elasticity and strength, um, so they're not only used for webs, but for sleeping sacks, egg sacks, even traps. So, net casting spiders, we have one species down in South Texas. They'll actually make a little trap between their front legs and kind of catch an insect with them. They'll just kind of throw it down over an insect that they come across. So it's pretty cool. I have not found one of those yet. It's on my list, um, but they're really neat. So not all spiders weave, weave orb webs either, and we'll kind of talk about that. But you do have your orb weavers. This is your Arrhenes. Um, they're going to do the standard, big, beautiful, orb-looking webs there. Here's another one, the Argioparantia, another very common orb-weaving spider. The cool thing about these, if you guys find these out in the field, I want you to look very closely around the spider's web. So sometimes they can actually be found with these little guys. You'll see sometimes a thread coming off the main web of that big spider, 
and you'll see a little tiny silver thing glistening in the sun. And these are called dewdrop spiders or argyrodes. Uh, and these are actually kleptoparasites. So these will hang around the Argyoporantial webs and they will often steal some prey and stuff from those big spiders. So they're really cute. I think they're really pretty. They have that really beautiful silver iridescence. So they're really neat. Um, another type of orb weaving spider are long jawed orb weavers. So it's a different family than the Argyoporantia but they'll make webs. Typically, they're gonna be found around water. Um, this one actually made a web very smartly right above some Gilgai at Matthew's Prairie. So the Gilgai is where there's kind of water seepage in there. And this one literally put its web parallel to the water surface. So it's gonna catch all those, you know, mosquitoes and stuff that are coming out and hatching from the water. Um, very cool, very smart way to do that. Um, this is a close up of a long jawed orb weaver again. Oftentimes you'll see them either on the web or they'll go and hide on like a piece of grass and make themselves very thin and long. They're very pretty close up, in my opinion. So back to the Argyoborantia or the yellow garden spider. Um, their webs are really cool. When they're younger, they actually do this kind of design that you'll see in the web. When they're older, they have that long zigzag design. So it actually changes over their life from what I've found. Um, the cool thing is that's actually called stabilimentum, and there's still kind of a debate about what this is used for. Um, some scientists think it's for bird avoidance, some think it might be for camouflage, and some think it might be for, you know, structural integrity of the web. And so here's actually a close-up of a stabilimentum um, of an adult one. So it's definitely, you can see here's the, the normal strands of silk, and it's definitely different. It's thicker, it's longer. It's, it's weird. It's really cool though. And let me actually show you guys a video of a very large orb weaving spider making that web. One sec. Okay. Again, these, these spiders were so big that I just used my cell phone for this footage. I, I got pretty lucky. So there she is. She is holding on. So they actually have claws on the tips of their legs. That's how they kind of grip on their own silk strands. And she is literally just creating that zigzag. It was a very windy day. So, I mean, it's kind of messy for a zigzag. Um, she also may have been pregnant at this point. So I don't blame her for it being that messy. There's a lot going on. Okay, let's get back. All righty. Cool. All right. So another orb weaving spider. These are actually their own separate family also. These are Euliboridae. Um, so these are called feather-legged orb weavers or hackled orb weavers. The really cool thing about these is these are one of the only non-venomous uh, spiders. So these spider spiders don't have any venom at all. What they do is they actually capture their prey in the web and they wrap it up with their silk, but then they actually regurgitate digestive enzymes and then kind of slurp up all the liquefied remains. Sounds really gross. It is kind of gross, but it's also really cool. And close up, they're really pretty. They got these little tufts of hair on their on their legs and they got like little bumps on their abdomen. So they're pretty cool. Another one are your um, sheet web spiders. You'll often see these in like forested areas and across the prairies. They literally have like a bowl shaped and they're going to be hiding at the very bottom of that bowl. So here's kind of a close up. And again, they look like a little speck to us from a distance, but if you get close up, they're actually really pretty and they have a lot of detail. Another one that you guys might often see are the funnel weaver spiders or the agalenids. Um, they make those large sheet webs that kind of run into a funnel at the very end and the spider will actually be hiding in the funnel. And what they'll do, this is a kind of a close up because people don't always get to see them up close is they will run out of that funnel when they sense something in their sheet and they will grab it and take it back home to eat it like this one did. Um, it actually was using my flashlight. This was at night. Um, she, there were some midges attracted to my light. They ended up landing in her web and she came up and grabbed it. So they're also really cool up close. Again, you have your dictinids or your mesh weavers, um, very tiny spiders. Um, it looks like the female is not letting the male come inside the sleep sack. I don't know if they had an argument or what's going on, but she kind of is keeping him out in this situation. But 
these guys are everywhere on the prairies. Um, they're on grasses. I found some around the rattlesnake master. Um, they're on leaves. They're in, um, they're just pretty much everywhere you look. If you look close enough, you might see some mesh weaver. They're really cool. The other ones that are really exciting are the crab spiders or the tamisids. Um, this is a female with prey. The cool thing is these are actually ambush predators and they kind of rely on their coloration to be able to not be seen. And then when something comes up to the flower, like a pollinator of some sort, in this case, I think it was a beetle, um, they'll actually use these two, four long legs in the front to grab it really quick and bring it in and inject it with venom and then eat them. So they're really cool. They come in various different colors. There's many different um, uh, genera of these two that are kind of hard to distinguish. There's actually a lot of um, ones that have not been described yet in Texas too. So really cool. Now, you know, spiders eat a variety of different things, but they also eat themselves sometimes. So this is a, a young Aris species jumping spider that's eating a Hensia species jumping spider. So they, you know, they'll eat pretty much anything that they come across unless it doesn't taste good to them. So a little bit of spider murder there. Um, this is another one. So this is another crab spider. Now this is not a flowering crab spider like the bright yellow and purple and white ones. There's also bark crab spiders and ground crab spiders. And of course, they're gonna be a little bit darker and different colored to blend in with bark or the ground or wherever they're gonna be. Now, this one's actually preying upon one of my favorite spiders, um, a Uriopus, which is a type of cobweb spider. And they're specialists. And I'll tell you about those in a little bit. And here's another really cool one. So spiders very often rely on camouflage this one was found all the way down near Brownsville, and it's a Mastophora species or a bolus spider. And they're also called bird dropping spiders, because if you actually look at this from above, it looks like bird poop. So I guess it's really good camouflage and, you know, who wants to go near bird poop? So um, the other really cool ones is always pay attention to ants because they may not be ants. Um, this is Cinemocena formica, or one of the ant mimic jumping spiders. So one, two, three, four legs there. And what they actually do is they'll wave around their first two legs and pretend they're antenna. So they do mimic ants. We have quite a few species of ant mimic jumping spiders in Texas and some ground spiders that will be ant mimics. Here's another one. And I first came across one of these probably in 2017. I was watching what I thought was a little Valentine ant and then it jumped and it hung down by a thread. And I was like, that's kind of weird. They're ant mimic jumping spiders. So this species is a little different. This one will actually wave around its second pair of legs that look like antennae. And again, they're specialists with prey as well. So I mentioned that Uriopus that was getting eaten by a crab spider. They're some of my favorites. Um, these are actually cobweb spiders, but they don't make the typical cobwebs. Like you'll see them in the corners of your house sometimes has that really messy web. Um, they don't use webs. What these guys do is they'll actively hunt ants um, and they typically prefer very specific species or genera of ants. So this one caught an ant there that it's eating. It might actually be a Solenopsis or one of the fire ants. Um, this one I also watched carry away this very large uh, carpenter ant. So I, I always look for these guys typically around at nighttime and around ants. And, you know, spiders eat lots of things, but they're also food quite often, um, especially if you like birds, don't kill spiders because birds also eat spiders, snakes will eat spiders, lizards will eat spiders, and other invertebrates will eat spiders. So this is actually a spider wasp. Um, what they do is they actually sting the spider to paralyze it. Um, some species will even chew off the spider's legs. And then what they do is they basically carry the spider back to their nest um, and they'll stick it typically like in a hole or somewhere that they fill up and that's food for their babies. So that's pretty cool. Um, now I came across a mud dauber nest. So mud daubers also specialize on um, spiders. There's a couple different ones that specialize on different spiders. And this is kind of how I learned about that. There was a mud dauber nest out at the LBJ grasslands that was being taken apart by really angry valentine ants. And I could see something red poking through and I'm like, that's kind of weird. So I kind of poked at it. And right before me, um, a whole bunch of black widows just kind of fell out. Um, 
So this was from a mud dauber that preys specifically on black widows. I have never seen this many in one spot. I thought it was really cool. And what you can see here is this is actually the larvae that's feeding on it. Um, so yeah, they, they'll lay their eggs in a little uh, mud chamber. And then they just start filling it up with paralyzed spiders. And again, these spiders are still alive. Um, so it's not really a great death for a spider, kind of sucks, but it's cool and it's nature. I call these spider pinatas. You never know what you're gonna get. Okay, so let's just go through more spiders that you'll find across the prairie and just spiders that are pretty common that you might see across Texas in general. So again, Phytopus audax or the bull jumping spider. These are super common. You'll see the black and white coloration and then the green chelicery. They get pretty big. Um, they're really cool. This little guy I actually saved from um, the gill guy. He fell in and couldn't get out and I couldn't just leave him there. So I actually took him out and it looks like he's waving thank you or I like to believe that. And I put him on a tree and let him go on his way. Um, another fit of his species, um, this was at Climber Meadow. I was actually talking with Brandon and I got distracted by a spider which is very common for me. And I picked it up and I showed him and she was really cute, really chill. She was cleaning her leg on my finger and she was really pretty. The Phytopus species are their biggest species of uh, jumping spiders that we have in the United States, and they're very diverse. They're very colorful. They're very pretty. I, I think they're amazing. And I do like to call jumping spiders the gateway spiders because I think they're really cute and they get people to kind of love spiders. So this is a Phytopus mysticeus, aka the high eyelash jumping spider. As you can see, they got those big tufts of hair. This is another super common spider that you guys might see. It's a jumping spider also. It's a tan jumping spider or Platycryptus indatus. They have those chevrons on the back. The females have a white stripe under their eyes here and males will actually have a pretty copper color under their eyes. Another very common one, the Hensia palmarum. This is a male. These are ones I've also seen do the really cool mating dances with the females. So they're very pretty, they're very colorful. Um, the males will just like shake their legs at each other. It looks really cool. Um, and then the females are just, they're still pretty. They definitely have some patterning there, but quite different from the males. So a lot of dimorphism. Another one that you will very likely see, and sorry, the frogs decided to do some crawling. I do have some tree frogs here. Yeah, he's gonna do that. Um, <laughs> this is a Pusitia viridens or a green link spider. This was over at Leela. Um, now, some of them that I've noticed, depending on the time of year maybe, or the plants they're on, they'll actually start getting a little bit of red in their abdomen, which is really cool. Um, she was pregnant, so that's why her abdomen is very enlarged there. But you'll see them like this, a little bit smaller. This one was on some rattlesnake master um, at, out at Mary Talbot Prairie. Um, and this is another one eating some sort of Miridae or uh, plant bug. So anytime you see big sunflowers or something, always take a peek behind it because sometimes they'll hide right behind the flower and kind of run on the front to grab pollinators and stuff. Um, this is another type of lynx spider, but a different genus. So this is the Oxyope salticus. These guys are really tiny and you'll actually see them hopping in the grass a lot. So some people often confuse them for jumping spiders, but they're actually related to these guys. And here's another one, just kind of a close-up of another different Oxyope species. I just think they're really cool looking. They're kind of known to have these really spiky looking legs. And again, I'm not, I don't think I've mentioned it, but all of the spiders we've seen so far are not medically significant to humans. They do have venom, they're, but they're harmless unless you happen to be allergic to it, which most people are not. Um, but I'll get into the medically significant ones in a little bit, but Wolf spiders are really cool. This is one that is just in the leaf litter there. Um, some of my favorite though are the rabid wolf spiders. So this is a rabid wolf spider sitting on Texas vervain. Um, she was kind of dancing across the tops of the little flowers. Um, now for this one, the striping is diagnostic and these are actually some of the few wolf spiders that you can actually probably tell it a species based on just a picture. So they got the white and the black stripes and then she has the chevrons back here in the dark spots there. Now compare it to this one. This is also a rabidosa, but this is a rabidosa punctulata or a dotted wolf spider. So they still have almost the same looking stripes on the, ab on the cephalothorax, but there's no chevrons in the back there. So chevrons, 
no chevrons. So we actually have two or three different species of rabidosa here in Texas. I think there's another species when you go far down near Mexico. And here's just another wolf spider. Again, I'm not actually sure what genus this is, but it's, I just think they're pretty and they're very diverse with their patterns and the colors. This one's eating something. I'm not sure what it's eating. Another common spider you might find or are the nursery web spiders or Pisarina mira. These are actually related to the fishing spiders that you'll often find near water. Um, she's pregnant. Um, they're really cool because they also will care for their young. So they'll basically lay this big egg sack and they'll hatch and they'll actually stay there and protect that, that eggs and those babies for quite a while. So this is what this one's doing. She actually has an egg sack up in here higher up in the flower. So I just saw her hanging down and took a picture. I didn't want to bother her too much. More crab spiders because they're really pretty and really cool. So this is another one um, sitting on the, the flower here. And again, they'll just sit there and wait for, you know, a bee or anything to kind of come by. And then here's another one to show the color differences. I think this is a Mechafesa. They, she has a lot of hair on her head there. Um, so some of them, the diagnostic feature is actually if they have hairs on the top of their heads and it, it's still hard and they're very diverse and not as well studied as maybe some other spiders like the jumping spiders, but also very cool spiders. Um, and then here's another crab spider. This one was found, I actually just turned a leaf over and she was right there behind the leaf. And I think she has a pretty cool face and eyes. And then orb weavers, there's tons of varieties of orb weavers, they're super diverse, they're really cool looking. Um, these are actually pretty common. These are Acanthopura species of orb weavers. So they have these really like sharp ridges around their abdomen and even on her face there. Here's another picture of one. Um, and then these are really cool. If you're near a forested area, these kind of are over a little bit more East Texas, the Micrathena sagittata or the arrow-shaped orb weavers. So really cool looking just it's just crazy how cool these look to me um this is the bottom of her this is her spinnerets that you can see there um this is another cool one that we found out at i think it was at the talbot brothers prairie i got really excited this was actually in the woodland side of the talbot brothers prairie um i always wanted to find one of these this is the marbled orb weaver um bright orange marbling really cool looking spider again harmless but they just look really cool and they're really pretty and then these are some of my favorite also that are found here in Texas. Um, they're actually pretty common. This one right here, the Arrowhead Orb Weaver, more common towards the east, but these we should be able to find all over the DFW typically. So you have your Micrathena gracilis or your Spine Micrathena, your Arrowhead Orb Weaver or your Varicosa arenata, and your Gasprocantha cancriformis, it's a mouthful, or the Spiny Back Orb Weaver. Now these are some of my favorites and it's because they come in a variety of colors. So I'm trying to find all the colors. So this is kind of like an orange red one. This is a white one that are very common. There's a yellow one, but there's even some that have white and red or red and black and white. So there's a lot of variation with these and they're really cool. Um, these were found around Rockwall and a couple other places across the DFW. And then these are also very common. These are the orchard orb weavers or the Lucage venusa. They're also in that long jawed orb weaver families. So their webs aren't gonna be straight up and down. They're gonna be kind of almost parallel or in like a weird shape and they'll be hanging right under them. Okay, now let's talk about the medically significant spiders. So we have two types of spiders that you wanna take caution with. Um, one of those is a Loxesceles reclusa or the brown recluse. Now these guys received a very bad rap but there's also actually a lot of misdiagnoses of recluse bites. There are actually staph infections. So sometimes when people get bit, we have staph naturally occurring on our skin and it actually presses that staph into your skin. And honestly, if you didn't see the spider bite you, there's no way to tell if it was a spider bite because a lot of bites and even just skin infections look the same. Um, with the, these guys, um, yeah, they can bite you. What I recommend is always just watch where you put your hands and your feet. Always check your shoes if you're in an area that has known recluses. Um, and then again, if you get bit, go see a doctor to make sure you're okay. Um, loxosalism, I don't think occurs in very many cases, but it's always best to be safe. But this is kind of how they look. This is the fiddle shape that people often talk about. Um, you can't always just rely on that because there's actually a lot of spiders that have kind of that fiddle shape to them. Um, so 
just basically be careful with any spider. If you don't know what it is, don't pick it up. Um, but these are really cool. This is a male. These are his pedipalps. And they actually have six eyes. So there's two here, two here, and two here. So that's your fox ocelles. And then the other one we need to look out for are the black widow spiders. Um, and these can be found all across Texas. I think we have about four species occurring in Texas, the Southern Black Widows, Western Black Widows, Brown Widows, and potentially Northern Black Widows. So the females are considered medically significant. So again, don't be picking stuff up if you don't know what they are. Um, and the males and juveniles are not really, um, but again, I would be careful because they do have neurotoxic venom. Um, I handle multiple spiders. I recommend that people do not pick anything up if they don't know what it is, whether it's a spider, or an insect, or a snake. So just. Black and they'll only have a little bit of red. Definitely. So. That's it. You know, spiders are actually super beneficial. I, I would suggest don't. They are in our house and I may occasionally bring in a spider or two. I also always move them if I don't want a specific spider in my house to our garden and they take care of a lot of stuff. They'll eat aphids. They'll eat all kinds of stuff. So Again, the vast majority are harmless to humans. You really only have two to be kind of concerned about. The rest are not considered medically significant. Um, but yeah, that's the presentation. And here are just some books and references um, in case you guys want to, to see anything. These are the books that I have. My main source of learning has been iNaturalist. It's been value, such a valuable resource as iNaturalist. But Bug Guide is really cool and I actually have all these other books. So. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. It's a great presentation and great photos. I especially enjoyed the videos. Uh, let's look through our chat and see what we have here. Uh, okay. Erica, uh, and I'm not sure if this is a question or a reaction when you're talking about uh, uh, spider molt. Uh, she, uh, observation spiders molt? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Yes, they molt. That's how they grow. So the funny thing is, if a spider is a juvenile, a lot of times you can't tell yet if it's going to be a male or a female. It actually, you have to wait until almost their final molt. They can molt multiple times until they're adults, and then you know if it's a male or a female. So yeah, that's how they grow. All right. Uh, Lynn observes fabulous photos. Very, very right, Jolynn. Uh, Grace, when, back when you were talking about uh, a uh, spider, a particular spider that was a cannibal. Uh, she says spiders, <laughs> so does that apply to multiple species? Yeah, so spiders, spiders will eat their own species occasionally and even other species of spiders. Some of them are very, they'll just eat anything that walks by them. So it just depends on the spider, the species of spider, but yep. All right. Pam says great presentation. We, we're getting some thank yous from different uh, people. And then let's see, uh, Joe Lynn has a question. Could you talk a little bit about spider intelligence? Yeah, so I, I like to think that the mygalomorph or the tarantulas are very just primordial and they just kind of go based off of what they feel like doing. They're not as intelligent, but jumping spiders are found to be very intelligent compared to other spiders. Um, and again, they have some of the best eyesight. They've also been found, there's a species called Portia fimbriata, I believe somewhere in Europe or somewhere like that. They will actually problem solve. So they will, let's say, try to predate on an orb weaver spider. And they'll actually go up to the edge of the spider's web and kind of make a pattern on it to get the spider to run down. They go around behind it, swing down on a web and then kill that orb weaver. So some of them are pretty intelligent. Great. So, uh, got some more thank yous. And uh, Grace wants to know uh, when she, first of all, she observes that they're amazing animals. But do you recommend that we wipe out sp spiders or leave them be? Um, no. I think spiders are, answer. <laughs> yeah, spiders are hugely important in, in the ecological web. I actually have a 
spoke about that, spiders and ecological webs. So they're very important and they're actually really important for pest control. You probably have them all over your house and you don't even notice it, probably because they're controlling your pests pretty well too. Whenever I hear people say, oh, there's spiders in my house, I'm gonna call the exterminator. My thought goes immediately to, what do you have in your house that the spiders are eating? Because they're there because there's probably food there, which could be roaches, which could be you know other bugs and ants. So the spiders aren't really the problem. Like I said, most of them are pretty harmless. I always leave spiders. I take them outside sometimes, but I have them in this room living in the corner. Anytime a fly comes in, if we open the door, they actually eat that fly for us. So I think they're very beneficial and I, I leave the spiders alone as much as possible. Great. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, again, wonderful presentation. Thanks, Megan. Uh, we thank everybody yep. who joined us. And we hope to see you at our next Master Naturalist Present Talk, which is going to be on May 21st. And uh, that's going to be on mushrooms and other fungi. So that should be, or is it fungi or fungi? Correct. So uh, we hope that many of you will uh, join us then. Thank you very much and see everybody uh, next time.